Oh, good morning, brothers and sisters and young people. I'm glad to see a good number of you here, which I didn't quite expect. <laughs> so, good on you. The title for this study is taken from Romans chapter 8. If you turn to Romans chapter 8, although we read it yesterday, let's just read the last few verses of this chapter, starting at verse 35. Says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And here the apostle lists the difficult circumstances in which he found himself many times in the verse 35. He had a fair share of his tribulations, but we ask ourselves, how did he conquer the fear which he undoubtedly must have experienced when he spent nights in the deep and in jail? We too may find ourselves in difficult circumstances when we show our love for the truth and stand up for the truth. The Apostle Paul exhorts us to be followers or imitators of me as I am also of Christ. And what did Christ do when he was persecuted? If you go to 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter 2, verse 21, about the middle of yeah, verse 21, for even here and too were, were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. So we should learn from this that when we are in difficulties, we should commit ourselves to God. And how can we do that? If not through prayer. And using the Psalms, we commit ourselves to God. It puts our minds right, for we develop the mind of Christ. Now well, we started a new day, didn't we? <clears throat> it was a bit hard, but it was a new day. And if you go back to our Psalm 5, which we read this morning, then the best way to start a day, as I'm sure most of you do, is with a prayer to God. Now, this Psalm 5 is actually a morning prayer, as it says in verse 3. My voice shall thou hear in the morning, Yahweh. So it is a morning prayer. But what that is, does that first verse, or the title in the KGV actually mean to the chief musician upon Nechilot, a psalm of David. Translating it, it means to him that overcometh toward an inheritance, the best fruits for the beloved. Nechilot means an inheritance, and the Hebrew word upon is not upon, is not al, it's el, it's toward. Or, as Fennec actually says, is the power of the inheritance. And of course, that is expressed in verse 7. But as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy. That's our inheritance. That's where we want to go to. So we use this prayer in the morning. We are thinking of the inheritance which has been laid up for us. Look at Psalm 16, which speaks about an inheritance in verse 5. 
Yahweh is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. The lions have fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. I will bless Yahweh who has given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night seasons. I have set Yahweh always before me. Because he's at my right hand, I shall not be moved. So to get an inheritance, we must set Yahweh always before us. From our waking hours till we go to sleep. Because that can change our mind and our behavior. It will make us receive God's counsel and his instructions and it teaches us to commit our ways unto Yahweh every minute of the day. So if you say this psalm with all your heart, then we are ready to receive God's counsel and to be led by the Spirit. You see, it starts then like this. Give ear to my words, Yahweh. Consider my meditation. You can't say this, Sam, early in the morning, if you haven't meditated on anything. We should have meditated on things. Otherwise, we can't say this, Sam, and we can't pray to God. So, I see that the Psalms work two ways. It's a prayer to God, but we can only say this, Sam, if we really mean it. You can't say, consider my meditation, if you've thought about nothing at all. And then it continues saying, My voice shall thou hear in the morning, Yahweh. And then it continues, In the morning will I, it says, direct my prayer. But my prayer is in, in italics. It isn't there in the Hebrew. Because you already said that you will pray. The word direct means to arrange yourself. In the morning will I arrange myself unto thee, and I will look up. And that is what we do when we use this psalm. So in the morning we pray to God, and we have meditated on him, and now we are going to say that we are going to set our life in order. And how I could do that? But the psalm tells us, doesn't it? What are the things that are spelled out for us? In verse 4, Thou art not an ale that has pleasure in wickedness. So if we encounter wickedness in the place we work, where we study, or wherever we find ourselves, then don't join in because you know that God has no pleasure in wickedness. And then neither shall evil dwell with thee. We mustn't do evil. It's very easy to do. But if you keep the psalm in mind, then it will direct your, your way of life with God. And it says, The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. It's all right to have a little joke here and there, but to act foolishly, if you do that, we won't stand in God's sight. That's what the psalm says. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. We're living in an evil world, and I thought that was made plain to us last night. But God hates those things. So it's not only not joining in, but not even allowing it, and warning other people of wicked ways. Thou shalt destroy them that speak, well, leasing, it's not leasing a car, it's lies. God will destroy them that speak lies. And how easy is it, brethren and sisters, when you have a conversation with people outside to have a little lie or to make yourself look better. But God hates lies. And Yahweh abhors the man of blood and deceit. So there are six points here in these verses, four, five, and six. And if you just remember this psalm when we say it in the morning and keep it in our mind, it will direct our path. And then we commit our ways unto Yahweh. That is how this prayer can help us. And we soon find out that if we use these psalms for our prayers and we commit them to memory, or even a small section of it, and st stick it up here, then 
our minds become more pure, more like the mind of Christ, and less like our own mind. It's good to start the day with prayer. David always did so. I put a few things on, on the overhead, but look at Psalm 63. It's a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. And it says then, Elohim, thou art my ale. Early will I seek thee. The word early is the word for shachar, that is the darkest part in the night. We had a good opportunity to put this into practice when the alarm went off three o'clock in the morning. Yes, it was still dark. When David woke up in the wilderness and it was dark, he said, in the early dark morning I will seek thee. My soul thirsts for thee. My flesh longs for thee in a dry and weary land where no water is. David said this psalm in the wilderness. The nation of Israel was formed in the wilderness, far from the distractions of the world. But if we love the world more than God, we won't pray this psalm. The peasant world has many attractions, especially for young people. The question is, do we look upon the world in which we live as a wilderness? Or do we take full advantage of all the distractions, the so-called attractions it offers to us? So it becomes clear that if we do use the Psalms and we think about them, that it will change our mind and it brings us closer to God. And we are in good company when we pray in the morning. Daniel prayed three times in a day, in the morning, at the time in the afternoon, at evening sacrifice, and before he went to bed. And also David prayed in the morning. You can see that Daniel prayed three times in a day. David also three times in a day, Psalm 55, evening and morning and at noon will I pray. Psalm 59, I'll sing aloud of thy mercy in the morning. Psalm 88, in the morning my prayer shall come before thee. 119, I prevented the dawning of the morning and I cried. So it is a good thing to start the day with God, to commit yourself unto him, keep those guidelines in mind which the prayer Psalm 5 says, and then we are ready We've arranged ourselves to face the day. And then before we go to work, we have breakfast and we give thanks for our food to God and it is a good thing to do. But it is easy to fall into kind of a Christadelphian phraseology. You know, we thank God for the food that we are going to eat and we pray that the strength derived thereof we may use in thine service. Now, we don't serve God with our stomach. Jesus fasted for 40 days and he still served God. But it's good to give thanks for food. And why not use the Psalms for giving thanks? You, know, you can compose a prayer using Psalms. This is something I often say. The earth is Yahweh's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Because God gives rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous, so that the soil produces food. He just got to thank him for it. The eyes of all people and animals alike wait upon thee, and thou givest them their food in due season. You can say something like this, bless our Elohim people, and make the voice of his praise to be heard, which holdeth our soul in life and suffers not our feet to be moved. I always end giving thanks for my food by saying, who gives food to all flesh for his mercy endures forever. I'm not telling you how to give thanks. I'm just showing you that it is possible to vary our prayer and use spirit words in even giving thanks for our food. It's good to give thanks. I'd like you to turn to Psalm 103. I suppose the older you get, the more thankful you are to God that he gives us life and still some energy. He gives us a family, a lovely companion. 
and there's so many things we should give thanks to God for. And this is a section, the first five verses, which I just so I know it by heart, and it it just wells up in your heart. It says, Bless Yah, my soul, and all my inwards, it actually says, his holy name. Bless Yah, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all thine iniquities, who heals all thy diseases, who redeems thy life from destruction, who redeems thy life from destruction, who crowns thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies not thy mouth, it says, and he would thy future with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. This is a psalm for the beloved. And if we say this psalm, then we are beloved of God too. So the psalms are very practical. We know that God will hear his own words, but you've got to think about it, that can we actually say or do we actually mean, do we live up to the words we say to him? Do those words help us to put us in the right frame of mind, to help our behavior, and then we can pray that psalm to God. We all fail at times, don't we, during the day, especially when we let our guard down and we don't remember our morning prayers. We're not the only ones that fail at times. But we believe, as it says, that if you confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the words to ask God for forgiveness have all been prepared for us. And they give us an insight into the sin of David and how he struggled and, and how he came out of it. And we go through the same process and the psalm tells us exactly how David felt. Go to Psalm 32. I start by saying, and he knew this beforehand, blessed, and often this word is, means happy, happy is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered, happy is the man unto whom Yahweh imputes not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. That is David. That is what he wanted to be. But like all of us, he fell, didn't he? Then he says, When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Selah. That we all go through this process. It's not easy to confess our wrongdoing. David tried to hide his sin with Bathsheba for a long time. He got her pregnant. He called Uriah over, hoping that he will sleep with his wife so they can pretend it was his baby. And he refused, so he, he had to send him back and put him in the battle and have him killed. And all the time he was trying to hide his sin. But while he was doing so, well, it says, I kept silence. And we can all, you know, um, remember that. We can all associate ourselves with it. We like to keep silence. We don't like to confess the things we've done wrong. But you know, your, your bones get old and you're roaring all day long. And you feel God's hand. They must have felt God's hand heavy upon him. His moisture turned into the drought of summer, Sila. And that's the state of mind David was in for, for a long time, more than half a year. I don't know exactly how long. And he was suffering because he didn't want to confess his sin. It was such a shameful thing to have to say. And when David, when Nathan the prophet came to him and he said, Thou art a man, it must almost have been this relief that David said, I have sinned. And then he could continue that next verse, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and my iniquity have I not hid, although it took a long time to confess it. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto Yahweh, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin, Selah. So the first Selah shows the state of mind we are in if we don't confess our sins. The second Selah is very valuable to remember that if you acknowledge your sin, then God will forgive it, and he could live again. He wrote another psalm, 
after that same event, which is Psalm 51, the very powerful psalm. When we lived in Jerusalem, we often used this psalm for our morning prayer because we've all sinned. And it gives an insight into how David felt. Look at verse 10. He, after he confessed his sin, he said, Create in me a clean heart, Elohim, and renew a right or a constant spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with a free or with a willing spirit. He couldn't be king anymore. He couldn't give guidance to his people. He didn't feel spiritual anymore. Because only when God created a clean heart in himself, in David again, and he was sure that he was not cast away from God's presence, which we are if we don't confess our sins. Then in verse 13 says, I will teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. How can we teach other people when we haven't confessed our own sins? See, David's heart at this particular time was not right this God. It's always good to examine our heart. See, a psalm which is very powerful and often when you come to the truth early on, you can associate with this Psalm 139. And if he just would keep this always in our head, it would help us so much. 139, to the chief musician, the psalm of David, for him that overcometh is the best fruit of the beloved. And it gives you an insight into God himself and our relationship with him. It says, Yahweh, thou hast searched me, and known me. Thou knowest my down sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways, for there is not a word in my tongue, Yahweh. Thou knowest it all together. And if we realize that God looks down on us, He can look into our heart every minute of the day, then we are more careful how we conduct ourselves in the day. But then, if we do that, then we get confidence that we can pray this psalm to God and look at Psalm 20, uh, the verse 23 at the end of the psalm. Then they could say, Search me, Elohim, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me into the way everlasting. If you go to Psalm 17. Because if we are right with God, we can say this, this is verse 3. And can we really say that, brothers and sisters? Thou hast proved my heart, thou hast visited me in the night, thou hast tried me and found nothing. I am purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. And that is a beautiful state of mind to have, brethren and sisters. There's another very practical psalm which helps us to develop a pure heart and to keep that perfect man in focus, and it's Psalm 15. It's such a beautiful, short psalm. It's the best fruit for the beloved. Yahweh, who shall dwell in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? You remember Psalm 5? For him that overcomes towards an inheritance, that is our inheritance, to be in the tabernacle of Yahweh, to dwell in his holy hill of Jerusalem in the kingdom. Well, only people that are like this will be there. He that walketh uprightly, worketh righteousness, speaketh the truth in his heart, backbite is not with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, doesn't take up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is contempt, 
but he honors them that fear Yahweh, swears to his hurt, and changes not, put it not out his money to usury, nor take his reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. Learn the sound by heart, brothers and sisters. You have it with you all the time. Remember Harry Tennant once saying, when he visited people in the hospital and they couldn't use their hands, they couldn't hold the Bible open, how much scripture do you have at your command if you don't have the Bible? You can say the Lord's Prayer, maybe Psalm 22. If that's all we know, it's pretty poor, isn't it? These Psalms have been designed to be prayed to God and they put us right. It helps us also to control our thoughts, how to channel our brain functions into the into the right directions, not to be distracted by mobile phones and iPods and iPads and whatever we have. There's a lot of this distress in the workplace and at home. We are exposed to advertising that prey on our lust and our desires. There's peer pressure among young people. They all know our, the advertisers all know our weak points. And the Apostle Paul also knew about this human weakness. I saw another law in our members warring against the law of my mind and bringing into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Then he counsels in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. He speaks about our warfare. Verse 4, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mightily, mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations or reasonings, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And listen to this. Bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. How many thoughts go through our heads all day long? I'm still struggling with it, brothers and sisters, to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. But I found this psalm such a great help because they put our minds right. Whenever a wrong thought comes in your mind, oh, let's just say a psalm or a portion or one verse or a sila verse. It helps you in your life. It helps us not to listen to the inner voice. And it would have been more suitable to silence it, just as David did for a while when he had sinned with Bathsheba, and he didn't silence that, that, that voice that made him sin. So I said before in Psalm 5 and verse 1, it says, Consider my meditation. Says in Psalm 19, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, Yahweh, my strength and my redeemer. Well, how do we meditate? Does it mean sitting on the floor with your knees crossed and your hands up and you empty your brain? That's not meditation. It's just nothing. It's emptying your mind. Meditation means to Think about something. Look what it says in Psalm 63. See, often we can't sleep, especially after last night, and it says in verse 6, I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches. Now what do we think of, think about when we wake up in the middle of the night? About all the troubles of the, of the previous day, about the, the fight you had with a colleague at work or some kind of a discord in the family. No, you focus on God's word. 
It says in Psalm 77, it's on the screen there, I will meditate of all thy work and talk of thy doings. Psalm 119, I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. So we need to meditate on something, namely on God and his work, and to think of his precepts. And the word meditate is the same as speak in Hebrew. And so when it says, my mouth shall speak of thy wisdom, and the meditation of my heart shall be of understanding, those are the words uh, for meditation. It says, how love I thy law, it is my meditation all the day. And it helps us to meditate. And that actually is the word haga in Hebrew. That's the word haga. That means to meditate. Quite interestingly, in modern Hebrew, you remember how Eliezer ben Yehuda tried to use old biblical Hebrew for modern concepts? You drive a car, don't you? And I'll be glad there's a steering wheel, because otherwise you crash into things. So the steering wheel makes it possible for the car to go in the right direction. You know what's called in Hebrew? A hege. Same as the words for meditation. As a steering wheel steers the car through the roads, so our meditation will steer us through life. Very clever, that was. And so the Psalms are our instrument to help us meditate. Look what it says in Psalm 9. Go to Psalm 9, please. Because there that word, higayon, is used. In verse 16, it says, Yahweh is known by the judgment which he executes. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. Higayon sila is an important verse because Yahweh is known by the judgment which he executed. We saw last night that fierce judgment which God poured out on those wicked cities. And the wicked were snared in the work of their own hands. Those are just things to meditate on. No point being jealous of the wicked. Of the wicked, we need to see their end, and then we won't be distracted by them. Psalm 19, let the words of my mouth and the meditation, the higayon of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight, Yahweh my Redeemer. And so higayon is an interesting word. It helps us to meditate on God's words. It says in Psalm 1, uh, this happy is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of Yahweh, and in his law does he meditate day and night. There's actually a very interesting connection with the book of Esther. And I'd like you to go to the book of Esther. We know the story of the King Ahasuerus. He had a wife, he put on a feast, and Vashti wouldn't come because she kept her own feast. She didn't want to, you know, although dressed in a beautiful dress, she had a beautiful countenance to show herself in front of all those men. And she didn't realize that all her beauty was derived from the king. And so the king was going to look for a new queen. And remember that all those virgins were gathered together. And in verse 12, it says, of chapter 2, Now when every maid's turn was come to go in to King Ahasuerus, after she had been twelve months, according to the men of the women, for so were the days of their purification accomplished, six months with oil of myrrh, the oil of myrrh is used in the anointing oil, which represents the spirit word of God, and six months with odors and other things to the purifying of the women. 
probably incense, which is a type of prayer. So thus came every maiden unto the king. Whatsoever she desired was given her to go with her out of the house of the women into the king's house. In the evening she went, and on the morning she returned into the second house of the women to the custody of Shagas, the king's chamberlain, which kept the concubines, and she came in into the king no more, except the king delighted in her, as she was called by name. Basically, it was a house of death that the king didn't call you. You were stuck there, and you couldn't marry anybody else, and this way you spent the rest of your life. But now, verse 15, when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abigail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come to go in unto the king, she required nothing but what Haggai, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women, appointed and as to obtain favor in the sight of all them that looked upon her. And then the king made a great feast in verse 18, or verse 17, the king loved Esther above all women. She obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So he set a royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of fasting. But we want to be the bride of Christ. When he is going to be king, then we hope to be the queen, don't we? But how... Can we make the king love us? All those girls had to go through the same process of purification and then they could choose something extra. Well, I'm the girl, so what would you choose? Girls, women, you go to the king? Nicely colored socks or so, or nice shoes, some, some earrings or necklace. You go to the hairdresser, have a nice little hairdo. What do you do to please the king? Well, Esther did something, and she won the contest, as it were. As a pity that we don't know what made her acceptable was the king. Now, you must have the right idea when those, one of those young women went to the king. It wasn't just to spend a night with him. Because the king had a full day of work to do. He had to receive guests. And the queen was his companion. She had to be able to hold a conversation with the guests. And she must show an interest in the work of the king. Knowing that even if she would marry the king and have children, that she must be able to bring up those children because the king was very busy. He needs a wise, an intelligent companion. A king has only so much interest in talking endlessly about hairdos and earrings and so on. The interesting thing is that it is possible to know what made Esther accept it with the king? She took nothing but what Haggai had appointed. Now, Haggai is the same word as Higayon. Same word as Hagad is where it comes from. It means meditation. Why did God choose Mary to be the mother of his son? Because she pondered those things in her heart. She thought about things. She was a re had a reflective mind. And that's what the king needs. He needs to be able to trust his queen to look after the wives of the ambassadors and to entertain them in an intelligent way. A bit in the bed, that's part of life, but it's only a very small section of it, isn't it? So he wanted a woman that can think, uh, can speak, that has read that is intelligent and it is attractive. And we can be like that if we meditate on the word of God. And I found that there is no part of scripture so powerful to do that as the Psalms. I would like to read you something, because we've got a few minutes left, of the writings of John Thomas. See, been a struggle in our community all the time how to praise God and how to, uh, to pray to him. Now, the Apostle Paul says, I will sing with the Spirit, I will sing with the understanding also. And the word sing is actually the word psalm. 
So I will sing with my understanding, and I will psalm with the understanding. John Thomas wrote in 1836 an interesting article in the Apostolic Advocate in the second volume called The Psalmody. And in his terminology, that means the hymn book. I already quoted you from Elpis Israel that John Thomas wrote, It is true that no man has a right to worship God as he pleases. This is a Protestant fallacy. Man has a right to worship God only in the way God himself has appointed. Then he writes, The word psalmody is compounded of psalo, to sing, or a poem or a composition in measure. This is its general signification. In its restricted and scriptural sense, the term is applied to the singing of meters or measures dictated by the Holy Spirit. Psalmody under this limitation was the means prescribed by the apostle to the Ephesians by which to accelerate and cheer their hearts. He presented as the antithesis to wine and says, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. And again he says, let the word of Christ dwell, rich, dwell in you richly with all wisdom. Teach one another and admonish one another by psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing with gratitude in your heart to the Lord. Many people ask him, well, what psalmody, what hymn book shall we use? He said, I reply, the book of psalms. This was the national psalmody, the national hymn book of the Jewish nation for many centuries. It is full from beginning to the end of the word of Christ. Jesus and his apostles have enstamped upon it the divine imprimatur, whatever that means. And all things must be fulfilled which were written concerning me, says Jesus, in the law, the prophets, and the Psalms concerning him. So he was on the right track. He loved the Psalms. Then he writes, if there were no other prophecies available to us than those contained in the book of Psalms, these contain abundant and sufficient testimony to prove that the Messiah of God should be a sufferer for sin, that he should be declared righteous by a resurrection from the dead, be exalted to the right hand of the majesty on high, be an object of adoration, that he should descend from heaven again, attended with incessant lightnings that should come to Zion, raise the dead, subdue the nations, and establish his name forever. All that, he says, you can learn from the Psalms. The whole gospel is laid out for us in the book of Psalms, says John Thomas. And he was struggling with the hymn book because it was Robert Roberts who brought him the golden harp. And John Thomas loved the Psalms. It is one of the best psalmodies, one of the best hymn books, and we call it one of the best because one of the least inconsistent with the truth is the collection of rhymes in use among us. But still, the objections to other psalmodies lies with equal weight against this one, namely, (laughs) it is composed of uninspired ditties. That's John Thomas. Hence, our hymn book does not contain a single spiritual song or song of the Spirit. In my view of the case, the psalmody of the body of Christ ought to be as spiritual as the revelations of the Old and New Testaments. And we might just as well have a creed book for our Bible as human poetical compositions for our psalmody. Uninspired men, however great, good, learned or poetical, are all incompetent to the task of composing a psalter fit for the celebration of the works, the wonders and the excellencies of the Lord our God. Then he asks himself, what can be done under these circumstances? In reply to this inquiry, he says, I would observe that if I had no remedy to propose, I should have remained silent upon this topic, which is a delicate one. It's difficult. We all love our hymn book. But you've got to be careful. There are things in there which are not scriptural. 
that had I only a new compilation of uninspired rhymes to offer, the foregoing observation would be invidious, but I feel as free from this imputation as though no meters were in use of us. I now advocate the claims of a psalmody of which the Holy Spirit is the author, in preference to all others whatsoever. I have therefore, being encouraged by several brethren to undertake the work, determined to attempt the improvement or rather the restoration of the ancient psalmody of the body of Christ. Now I'm more impelled to essay this in obedience to the command of the apostle, which has already been considered a command I conceive as much to be obeyed as any other that can be adduced. And he started to put the psalms to meter. There's an example here of Psalm 51, here in the psalmody. He went through the Psalms and put them to meters, so without changing the words hardly, he wanted to use the Psalms and make the Psalms our hymn book. Uh, if you look through the old Christadelphians, you find several of those Psalms, 72 and other ones. And I don't know why that was never taken up. Maybe his work was destroyed by that fire that destroyed his printing press. It was certainly... John Thomas's idea that we should use the psalms in our worship, both in our prayers and in the hymns we sing. And he concludes his article with this. By query, a query by way of finale. What psalmody extant is it probable Messiah will choose to the praise and glory of God when he comes to open the worship of the millennial age? Would you select the rhythmical, uninspired traditions of any sect extant, or rather those spiritual odes, so replete with the celebrations of his varied fortunes as are the psalms, hymns, and songs of the Spirit of God, doubtless the latter. Let us then resolve to do so too. Brother John Thomas. Thank you.